I'm sorry that I'm two minutes late this morning. Uh, I was sitting right here staring out in the space thinking about things. I was all set up just like now. But I was, I guess I was doing what I did uh, for uh, 12 years of high school. Uh, 12 years of school. I was daydreaming. But I'm daydreaming about being with you on a Saturday morning. So here we are. Uh, I uh, I get a lot of emails, okay? <laughs> and many of the, the, the emails are, are from uh, 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 magicians asking, you know, questions about... Uh, uh, Alistair Crowley and um, uh, Alistair Crowley's magical uh, system and Alistair Crowley's magical uh, orders and uh, and all of that and I do my best to, to answer everything and uh, but for I, I've been getting emails since we've had emails and before that I would get letters uh, uh, because of my presumed uh, uh, authoritative position in uh, the OTO, uh, people have been writing me for years. And I threw together about 30 years worth of those uh, uh, questions and answers. And to tell you the truth, one of my favorite lawn books uh, is a compilation of, of the questions and answers that I've gotten over the over the years, and uh, many of those questions are probably the same questions that you were asking. Now, I don't always give the wisest or the most complete uh, answers, and sometimes I I uh, I get a little cheeky uh, in my answers, but that's that's just Babylon. Uh, but anyway. This morning, oh, and, and uh, also I've included uh, uh, a lot of my my priceless artwork, you know, stuff like this. Uh, like that's the this is the opening. That's the opening illustration. Let's see, can you see that? Here, do it that way. It should be the whole of the law there. Sun and moon can join. Babylon is a snake. Love is law. Love and the will. Things like that. And uh, everything I say is untrue. Though true, I try to make it. As soon the words escape my lips, would I had never spake it. And, uh, but anyway, there's all sorts of little treats in, in here. Constance. Uh, painted the the front and back uh, covers. Uh, the the back is just it's sort of a neutral thing, but uh, if you can see Babylon's turban there, and all sorts of under wonder, wonderful wonderful things, including my computer and my coffee cup and my glasses down there, and the hey the book's worth getting just for. St. Constance's cover artwork. But anyway, uh, the reason I got off on this is because I was answering another uh, another email just uh, yesterday, uh, which I'm not going to share with you. Uh, but it concerns uh, the, the concept of, uh, of gurus in the, the New Age, or the, the Age of Horus, or the Thulemic Age, or Thulemic Gurus, and Magical Teachers. Uh, so I'm going to read a question, and then I'm going to read you my, uh, my answer. So, Dear Babylon, now all of these letters didn't start off, Dear Babylon, okay. That's my thing. And I don't put anybody's name down here. Uh, I always say name withheld. So, Dear Babylon, I've been interested in 
language, mythology, literature, mathematics, Kabbalistic systems, theoretical physics, and a number of other intertwining subjects for quite a few years now. And I've taken a great deal of interest in the general conciliation of the semantic and the syntocratic, one might uh, say, though occult. Now, he gives a big, long German word here. Okay, and I'm sure many of you uh, uh, know how to pronounce Geistwissenschaft. And uh, in my footnote, it's, it's more frequently used in the plural form. Geistwissenschaften is a traditional division of uh, faculty of the German universities that includes subjects as philosophy, history, uh, uh, philosophy, uh, social sciences, and sometimes even theology and jurisprudence. Uh, most of its subject matter would come under much larger humanities faculty in the typical English-speaking university, but it does not contain any arts. Okay, so that's what Geistwissenschaften. So the guy is well read, okay? This guy is more educated, more uh, erudite, more, more, uh, uh, this guy's a lot smarter than Babylon is what I'm saying. And it's obvious, it's a great letter. Since I've read a few uh, and studied a few books by Aleister Crowley, 777, Book of Thoth, Book 4, etc., and reach quite a lot of personal views from both mathematical and semantic viewpoints on these matters. Since I have had an interest in the occult, Eliphas, Levi, etc., for some time, and since I've also had an interest in Freemasonry, the works of Albert Pike, Albert Mackey, etc., and De Luminarorden, uh, Weishaupt, but particularly Goethe, it seems right, so to say, that I finally joined the OTO uh, officially. And I have to assume that the OTO was enriched and nourished by this, by his membership. Okay, so this spring I'll be moving to uh, I won't say where, uh, where there happens to be a lodge. Okay. However, with regard to the AA, you seem to be the only person whom I have encountered in reading who has written anything straightforward and honest about it, who also wrote sensible opinions on the matter of how a student of Geistwissenschaften should be instructed which were in, in accord with Hegel's definition. So I must ask you about the AA. Salam, name withheld. Wow, that was such a wild, good letter that it, uh, it seems a shame to try to answer it with my my pedestrian ideas, but Babylon gave it a try. Hi, name withheld. I'm a bit of a heretic, at least in the eyes of a few lineage focused individuals when it comes to the subject of AA. Actually, I'm more of an anarchist. I'm pretty comfortable with the initiatory worldview that uses the tree of life to identify major landmarks of human consciousness. The Golden Dawn presented us with a road map. Alistair Crowley's AA obliges us to take the trip. I believe, at least theoretically, a place can be found on this map for every unit of evolving consciousness. And so, at least from one perspective, I consider every human being a charter member of the big generic AA. 
After all, Crowley considered Blavatsky an 8 equals 3, a master of the temple, and I'm almost certain she didn't have any AA paperwork from Crowley. I'm also not comfortable with the AA program of yoga, meditation, magic, and mysticism that Crowley lays out for the student in order for him or her to sequentially master and attain the levels of consciousness associated with the climb up the tree of life. Of course, I don't think the AA program is perfect, nor do I believe it is the only path upwards. In fact, it's very clear to me that relatively few spiritual seekers are suited by inclination and temperament for the subtleties and disciplines of AA work. Those who are, however, are most sublimely suited. You might be asking, quote, if Duquette is so comfortable with the AA in theory and practice, what makes him so heretical? <laughs> the answer is simple. I'm not completely on board when it comes to the AA student teacher program, at least how I've been able to observe it in action. As you know, in the East, there is a venerable tradition of guru or master and chila student. This simple system has served to transmit sacred knowledge and disciplines from generation to generation for thousands of years. It works and it works well. But in order for it to work, the chila must be driven by something more than zeal to learn. And the guru must be possessed of something more than mastery of the subject. The chila must be able to accept the guru as God made visible. The chila must be able to project upon the master all the qualities of infinite wisdom, omnipotence, and omniscience that one would associate with God. The guru must be loved as God, believed as God, trusted as God, obeyed as God, served as God. You might think this is a stupid, naive, and even dangerous attitude to take towards a, another human being. But consider for a moment the potential for learning when you believe with all your heart the teacher knows absolutely everything about everything. There is literally nothing you cannot learn at the feet of such a master. Of course, the guru is only human and has limits to what he or she can consciously teach. But if the chila is unaware of those limits, or his or her capacity for learning more than the guru is act, uh, more than the guru is actually teaching, is boundless. I'm going to repeat that sentence. But if the chila is unaware of those limits, his or her capacity for learning more than the guru is actually teaching is boundless. What does the guru need to possess to make this arrangement work? The guru must possess almost superhuman restraint. Restraint not to believe his or her own press. Restraint not to abuse the chila's unbounded love and devotion. Restraint to reflect the purity of the student's love back upon the chila. Restraint to keep his or her goddamn hands off the attractive chilas. Restraint to keep his or her school, ashram, or movement 
from turning into a cult. Such restraint is yogic discipline of the highest order. To be worshipped as a living God and not blowing it. For many reasons that, that should be obvious, this system does not work particularly well in the West. Not that it couldn't work, it just doesn't, especially when dealing with spiritual art of magic. Magicians have teachers, yes, but the magician's god is not one that is easily projected on another person, especially upon another ma magician. The magician's career is a bit lonelier. Alistair Crowley and his friend George Cecil Jones set up a system of magical study and instruction which on the surface appears to be a guru chila arrangement. Ideally, it is set up so that each student has a superior who is one step more advanced. The superior in turn has a superior who is one step ahead of him or her, etc. Early in my magical career, I was eager to join this chain and felt privileged to become a student of Phyllis McMurtry, later Phyllis uh, she went back to her maiden name, or Phyllis Seckler, whose AA superior had been Jane Wolfe, whose superior had been Aleister Crowley. Now, as much as I love and respected Phyllis, it never crossed either of our minds that I should devote, be devoted to her as if she was an omniscient goddess. Nor was it part of the program that I revere the memory of Jane Wolfe or even Crowley to that degree. Obviously, the AA was meant to be something other than the classic Eastern Guru Chila AA, uh, uh, AA system. At least in my case, and I always have to preface, at least in my case, okay, from my point of view, from my understanding. At least from my case, I've discovered it to be so. Several years ago, I received a letter from a woman who had been teaching magic for many years and had reached a point where her students were now beginning to teach also. She asked my opinion as to what traits a person should look for in a magical teacher. Here's my reply. What would the traits be of a magical teacher? Where magical teachers are concerned, I guess I sort of sit with my pea shooter at the very back of the class and on the extreme left wing of the building. Of course, I've read about great gurus who can read your mind, materialize in your bedroom to correct your spelling, masters who can describe to you your previous incarnations and itemize every arg article in your karmic luggage. I've read about them, but I've never met one. Magic, in my opinion, is something that can't be taught. It must be learned. Often you learn it from other people. However, the moment a person starts to identify him or herself as your teacher and you as the student, you both are setting yourself up for disappointment. Oscar Eckenstein, the man Crowley considered to be one of his greatest magical teachers, thought magic was silly and occultists a waste of time. Still. Crowley learned from Eckenstein how to master himself and develop his yogic skills and powers of concentration. Without those skills, magic is just theory. Regarde wasn't my magical teacher, but I learned a lot from his attitudes and the simple example of his life. He answered specific questions when I had them. 
but nine times out of ten I disagreed with him and ignored his advice, and nine times out of ten I was right. I also learned a lot from my formal AA superior. But I must tell you, I learned those lessons in spite of her efforts to educate me, rather than because of them. I certainly learned what a horse's asses someone can be when they presume to guide another's magical progress. But your question is fair, and I'm talking like an anarchist. Maybe I should actually try to make a suggestion.